Good afternoon, everybody. I'm very happy to open this B20 uh, dialogue on uh, the tax force integrity and compliance. So, Honorable Minister Di Maio, dear, my dear friend Patrizia, dear B20 members, distinguished guests. As I said, I'm very happy to open this B20 G20 dialogue organized by the B20 Tax Force on Integrity and Compliance. Uh, we've done a lot of this B20 G20 dialogues, uh, and uh, what I can tell you is that uh, these dialogues, uh, from our point of view, are key opportunities both for business and also for the G20 presidency to share priorities, objectives, to describe, uh, to, to discuss and make brainstorming or some of the key subjects that we are discussing. In the frame of the Italian B20, I want to underline very clearly that the themes of sustainable governance, transparency, integrity, and fair competition are of paramount importance. Uh, regulatory compliance failures cost time and money to companies, but sustainable corporate governance can do much more than simply ensure compliance and avoid extra costs. It can be a true lever for value creation. And since our goal as B20 is to discuss and make policy recommendations about what is the next growth and we want to have a, a more sustainable and inclusive growth, this is one of the key subjects. The B20 pursued common values and goals through the work of over 2,000 representatives. And this year we've seen a huge participation, including all major international corporations representing representing a community of over 6.5 million companies and businesses from all over the world. Navigating the B20 in a conjuncture like the current one, as you can understand, is a demanding exercise, and all the B20 members have taken up it very seriously, and I really want to thank all our participants for the great support. I'm proud of the commitment and attention that we have gathered across the G20 countries, and I look forward the B20 to result in a really impactful process contributing to best outcome of the G20 to Italy. And as you know, uh, we are finished our uh, work in terms of conclusion of the tax forces uh, um, uh, documents. And I will hand over this recommendation and our final communique to our Prime Minister Mario Draghi the 7th and, the 7th and 8th of October. Indeed, what we are ultimately looking for is a true partnership where the private and the public sector maximize the deployment of their potential. And I'm confident that today's discussion will enrich all of us. I will not go into details of today's important topics, and I will leave my very good friend Patricia to do it. However, I would like to offer a few remarks before the discussion starts. The first remark is that in this moment of unprecedented challenges, crisis and change, we must contain the increased risk of corruption and criminal activity. It is therefore paramount to identify and implement the correct measures to counter this phenomena and invest in transparency and integrity. This is a, a very first and very important remark. The second remark is that the B, as B20, we must rejoice with regards to news about programs which strengthen the link between transparency and, and public-private cooperation through the dissemination of best practices to prevent illegality. Best practices, exchange of uh, good uh, uh, examples is key for this. And my third remarks concern the implementation and the adoption of an effective sustainable governance. Now, more than ever, achieving sustainability targets and promoting a new concept that combines the ability to remunerate shareholders while creating value to stakeholders are absolutely fundamental. Allow me now to make my last remark. I really want to very warmly thank Patricia for her outstanding leading role in the integrity and compliance task force of our B20. Her passion and commitment brilliantly guided the proceedings of the task force. So thanks for the attention, and I wish to all of you a fruitful discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks to the chair of the B20. Thanks to Mrs. Emma Marcegaglia for her welcome. Please, uh, at first, let me introduce myself. My name is uh, uh, Roberto Tallei. I am deputy head and anchor of the international news at Sky TG24, the main 
uh, Italian uh, All News TV channel, and I will moderate this uh, dialogue between G20 on promoting sustainable governance, increasing transparency, and fighting corruption to enhance fair competition. I'm very happy to be with you uh, today. I really think this is a strategic uh, topic, not only for governments uh, and businesses, but also for citizens, because uh, we all know that uh, corruption is a, a cost for, for everyone. So we, we do need an environment based on equality and fairness and the each effort uh, towards this direction is welcome and is important. First of all, I would like to ask Mrs. Patrizia Grieco, uh, Chair of MPS and of the Integrity and Compliance Task Force, uh, to take the floor for her opening remarks. Please, Mrs. Grieco, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you, Emma. Welcome, uh, everyone, and thanks uh, for your participation uh, to this uh, B20, G20 dialogue uh, concerning uh, integrity and the compliance task force as clearly stated in the purpose of this initiative how to promote sustainable governance increase transparency fight corruption to enhance fair competition our work has been around integrity and compliance matters both are now taking on a broader scope especially due to this historical moment marked by new global risks and can be really addressed together with the idea of sustainable business. As B20, we want to direct our efforts towards a precise key objectives, such as accompanying major transitions, both green and digital, strengthening the resilience of the economic system, as well as their ability to mitigate inequalities and factors which have been tested by the pandemic crisis. The new idea of compliance that Integrity and Compliance Task Force has developed reflects a solid intention of creating an ecosystem where companies are called upon not only to pursue the profitability of their investment, but also to integrate interests for promoting other synergies and positive impact among the stakeholders. The severe socio-economic crisis generated by COVID-19 has intensified and expanded the various forms of public intervention in economic systems. And now more than ever, it results essential to increase effectiveness in the use of public funds, while improving mitigation measures aimed at reducing the increasing, the increasing level of risks of corruption and other illegal activities. Activities. Therefore, this situation represents a, a real opportunity to place a renewed focus on fighting corruption, strengthening integrity and enhancing transparency while reinforcing global solidarity. Business environment plays an essential role for boosting the post-pandemic recovery phase and supporting the fight against the future global crisis. In this context, our policy papers is based on two key elements. The fight against illegality, especially in sensitive areas such as public tenders and the management of financial flows by promoting transparency and efficiency and the promotion of sustainable governance in business to reshape processes to incorporate the ESG uh, factors into corporate compliance. In this regard, some main cross-cutting dynamics are to be considered. As a way of example, we can mention the impact of COVID-19, as we said, the role of large enterprise and state-owned enterprise with regard to the evolution of ESG uh, factors, the importance of broadening uh, small and medium enterprise uh, business opportunities, and the emergence of new risks, uh, other often um, sector specific, uh, example of corruption uh, risks uh, within uh, health and sports. Our task force has chosen to call for a stronger commitment from the G20 on four main key areas around which the four recommendations have been built. 
The first is uh, ensure a responsible conduct uh, through the procurement cycle from both uh, companies and governments. The second is to stimulate sustainable governance in business while focusing on the standards harmonization. The third is promoting a cooperative compliance model and rewarding system uh, through the adoption as much as possible of a, of a uniform approach uh, to, to legislative initiative so as to ensure a level playing field for companies operating in and across the G20 countries. And uh, third, last but not least, enhance beneficial ownership transparency. <coughs> Accordingly, for each recommendation, B20 members have developed a concrete and measurable policy actions that deserve urgent consideration. And our task force has also been working on identifying and designing a KPI, key performance indicators, per each recommendation in the paper. Such initiatives aim at tracing the impact of the policy paper's proposals regarding the current and future G20 presidencies. The KPI introduction can support the future B20 presidencies, which will be able to evaluate any progress and therefore build on tracked outcomes. As mentioned before, our policy paper is also built on a past G20 initiative. And thanks to the cooperation established with the G20 Anti-Corruption Working Group, uh, takes into account and is aligned with the objectives of their three-year action plan for 2019-2021, as well as the envisaged the G20 um, high-level principles on corruption-related organization the crime and the light uh, in the light of the higher risk of criminal infiltration in a post-pandemic uh, scenario. Such cooperation is a strong and efficient example of public-private uh, cooperation. Regarding the level of alignment among the B20 and G20 developed work, we notice also through carrying out dedicated meetings with the G20 anti-corruption working group that there is already a strong alignment between the two groups. In particular, such alignment can be noticed in some key areas, such as leveraging a digital transition in the public sector and related processes, promoting the use of effective asset recovery tools, enhancing beneficial ownership transparency in order to improve the quality and the adequacy of the related information, and stimulating the international cooperation and information sharing with other countries. Within this dialogue, we will present the integrity and compliance task force priorities, and each panel will focus on each of the four recommendations provided by the policy paper. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mrs. Uh, Grieco. Now, before uh, starting with, uh, with our panelists, I would like to welcome the video message that the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Italy, Luigi Di Maio, sent to us, please. Mrs. President of the Business 20, President of the B20 Integrity and Compliance Task Force, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to address this event aimed at fostering dialogue between the G20 and the B20. I thank the B20 for its continuous engagement and support. Your recommendations will provide significant inputs to the preparation of the G20 Anti-Corruption Action Plan for 2022-2024, which will be adopted later this year. Preventing corruption in all its form is key to achieve a sustainable development. The increasing involvement of Business 20 in the anti-corruption sector confirms that the new challenges in this area require the active participation of the private sector and civil society. Italy, as coordinator of the G20 Anti-Corruption Working Group, is fully engaged in this effort. While Magistrate Giovanni Tartaglia Polcini, chair of the Working Group, will specifically address its activities, on my side, I would like to touch upon three main points. Why the fight against corruption is a priority on the global agenda, 
why the business sector is essential player in multilateral anti-corruption processes and how we can intensify the B20, G20 dialogue and this topic for the future. First, corruption is a global threat challenging our societies and economies. It has a negative impact on sustainable economic growth, market competition and the rule of law. It undermines the trust between citizens and governments and the efforts to build prosperity and security for our countries and communities. Goal number 16 of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development remains a source of inspiration. It aims, in fact, at fostering peace, justice and accountable institutions as a cross-cutting objective. In June, a special session of the United Nations General Assembly against corruption took place for the first time in New York and adopted a political declaration. Building on this universal commitment, the Italian presidency of the G20 is putting a special focus on this issue. Our goal is to spread experiences and best practices in the fight against corruption in its newest, more sophisticated and dangerous forms. The Italian G20 presidency has set ambitious goals along three innovative lines of action to develop a set of common principles on preventing and countering corruption related to organized crime in the sports sector and in emergency situations such as the pandemic. Moreover, we are working on a collection of best practices developed by G20 countries to measure corruption based on objective criteria. With regard to my second point, the role of the business sector in multilateral anti-corruption processes, Italy underlines the importance of a multi-stakeholder approach in all multilateral fora. We support this concept in the framework of the G20, in line with the role of technical guidance recognized to Italy for its long-standing experience in anti-corruption. We have further reinforced this action when taking over the co-presidency of the anti-corruption working group in 2020. This year, as presidency of the working group, Italy continues to pursue the inclusion of the private sector and civil society. In particular, with reference to the action plan under negotiation, we look forward to the B20 recommendations on procurement, sustainable governance in business, public-private partnerships, transparency and digitalization, just to mention some key areas that will be discussed during this webinar. The business world can provide a key contribution to the promotion of human rights of a culture of legality and legally oriented environment. Companies can highly profit from a culture of integrity and rule of law in terms of reputation, competitiveness, business activity and prevention of crime. Large companies can lead by example, encouraging small and medium-sized enterprises to follow. This brings me to my third point. The fight against corruption must remain a priority for both public and private sector. The suppression of criminal conduct alone cannot be effective. We need to develop partnerships among public institutions, the private sector, academia, think tanks and civil society to encourage a shift in paradigm involving culture, social education and participation. Italy has been one of the first UN countries and the first among the G7 to adopt a national action plan on business and human rights. This accomplishment is consistent with sustainable development goal number 16, which, as I highlighted, covers accountability and the fight against corruption. A multi-level legal system combined with a legally oriented economic environment and the active vigilance of civil society is our best weapon against contemporary corruption. In Italy's innovative vision, anti-corruption is a testing ground for new forms of governance to develop a level playing field of rule of law binding people across continents. In this perspective, we should 
further strengthen the multi-stakeholder approach towards a mature sense of ownership on sharing the rule of law and the culture of legality. I'm confident that today's discussion will provide additional inputs and ideas to enrich the path we are sharing towards a successful G20. I thank you once again for your engagement and active contribution towards this goal. Thank you. This was the Italian Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Luigi Di Maio. And now uh, I would like to give the floor to Giovanni Tartaglia Polcini, who chairs the Anti-Corruption Working Group of the G20 for his remarks. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Dear colleagues, let me first of all thank all of you, and in particular, Mrs. Patrizia Greco, Chair of the B20 Task Force on Integrity and Compliance for the invitation. It's a pleasure and an honor for me to participate in this meeting, which I consider a valuable opportunity to engage in discussions on issues central to public debate and to lay the foundations for the collection of best practices. The G20 commitment to assure that a broad range of stakeholders may contribute to the development and implementation process of the high-level principles to tackle corruption worldwide targets not only public sector entities and institutions, but also groups and individuals from the private sector and the civil society in a wider sense. With this in mind, it was an honor and a pleasure for us to host sessions with the engagement groups during the first anti-corruption working group meetings in line with the spirit of inclusiveness and coherence with the multi-stakeholder approach. In fact, in order to build an effective and comprehensive multilateral approach to prevent and fight the corruption phenomena, the partnership with the engagement groups is, in our view, crucial. The B20 has, in such sense, distinguished itself by providing important contribution and cues of reflection for all of us. The synergy between the public sector and the private sector, and in general, the business world, gives added value to the work of the anti-corruption working group and to the common efforts in the cross fight against corruption. As chair of the anti-corruption working group of the G20, I would like to share with you some of the challenges and activities that the group has achieved and is in process of achieving in the global fight against corruption. First, let us firstly begin with the compendium of good practice on corruption measures. The document, which has been fully approved through silent procedure by the group, is based on the necessity of a corruption system based on real, objective, identifiable and verifiable data. As to why it is necessary to have tangible measurement, and I will go to, into more detail shortly after. Second, the other document which I am glad to announce is the high-level principles on corruption related to, to organized crime. Given that corruption often enables the infiltration of organized crime both within the public sector and economy, the primary aim of these high-level principles approved at the working group level is that of raising awareness on the emerging threats and providing political guidance for a new era of enforcement. The third deliverable, which has been approved by the group, is the high-level principles on tackling corruption in sport. The consensus generated behind the principles lies in the necessity of adopting a modern and a holistic approach that recognizes and considers how the new avenues of corruption thrives in sport, both on and off the field of play. The fourth deliverable, in view of agreement, is a crucial one. The high-level principles on preventing and combating corruption in emergencies, such as COVID-19 pandemic. The fifth is a self-assessment questionnaire on the implementation of enforcement of G20 commitments on foreign bribery. And then we have the core business of our remaining work this year, the 2022-2024 Anti-Corruption Action Plan and the Anti-Corruption Accountability Report. Please, if it's possible, we can share two slides resuming this snapshot of our work. Oh. 
Okay. As you can see, very quickly, we have pending action plan, the accountability report. We hope to have the consensus during the third upcoming meeting, 28th of September, 1st of October. And now we have approved the self-assessment foreign bribery report. Next slide, please. We have approved the high level principles corruption related to organized crime, the high level principles uh, tackling corruption in sport, and then at the end of the slide, the compendium of good practice on corruption measurement. For the high level principles preventing and combating corruption in emergencies, we need only a form to formalize the approval, but we are in view of adopt. Thank you for the sharing of the uh, slides uh, and uh, I go to the second part uh, very briefly of my speech. Having exposed this result, uh, it is now time to rightfully explain how this deliverable meet the recommendations made by the G20, the B20 working group, your task force, and how they are going to benefit also the private sector world. Before moving on, I want to specify that the business sector interests have always been within the G20 Italian delegation and this year the presidency and the anti-corruption working group minds and without its useful contribution these results I have just mentioned it could have never been achieved. Starting from the compendium of good practice on corruption it is clear that the overreaching effect of having objective indicators for measuring corruption will certainly benefit also business. Indeed, while we have always tried to measure corruption through indices based on its perception, these have over time shown their inherent limitations. They are indeed prone to generate partial results due to their subjective analysis of phenomena. And this is the rationale to a collection of good practices on corruption measurement also to help business sector to understand the effectiveness uh, and the closest to reality outlook of the corruption levels in a global framework. Concerning the high level principles of corruption related to organized crime, let me mention one principle of the document in which we say the partnership with the private sector address corruption uh, in uh, a strongest way and this is a reality. In the high level principles on technical corruption in sport, the anti-corruption working group has committed to protect one of the most important factors of the progress and human fulfillment, the ways in which the business world we gain from sports safeguard from corruption are invaluable. On the high level principles on preventing combating corruption in emergencies, I want to highlight that principle six contain the strongest call for public and private cooperation in the whole history of the G20 anti-corruption working group activities. As far as the self-assessment questionnaire on implementation and endorsement of G20 commitments on foreign bribery, it is uh, an uh, idea very clear that uh, we are speaking about the foreign bribery and the need of a legal framework which ensures a level playing field, first of all, for enterprises. Concerning the action plan, as the Honorable Minister said, now we are working to closing the language, taking into due account all the suggestions coming from the recommendation of B20. First of all, the um, uh, recommendation of beneficial ownership transparency, and uh, the uh, suggestions and recommendations on procurement. Finally, the anti-corruption accountability report this year is all on the business sector, on the integrity and pri of private sector, on transparency and liability of uh, um, legal persons. To conclude, I would like to stress once again that the fight against corruption cannot be undertaken nor won by suppressing criminal conducts alone. We all must work towards the consolidation of a new reality that builds on the strengthening of the rule of law through the direct involvement of responsible business 
in voluntarily supporting the construction of legal frameworks and the promotion of more responsible institutions that complement government actions. I, in particular, like to speak about multi-shareholder approach beyond the use of the term multi-stakeholder, which seems to recall something of alia, different from us. Is this the reason for which the business world I consider is not a stakeholder, but a central protagonist in the fight against corruption? In 2014, the most important document ever agreed on by the Anti-Corruption Working Group is the G20 high-level principles on corruption and growth highlighted what's important to understand the increasing of the cost for business, the discouragement of domestic and foreign investments, the high risk for all the business environments, the lowers of incentives of innovations, the distortion of market competition, and the hamper to the economic growth that corruption presents. In this light, in light of this, and with our shared common values and principles, I ask you again, as you demonstrated this year, very effectively to be co-protagonist and remain co-protagonist in the fight against corruption for the future. Thank you for all your attention. And thank you, Mr. Tartaglia Polcini. Now we can move on to our dialogue. As uh, it has been said, we will have four panels, one for each recommendation coming from the Integrity and Compliance Task Force. Uh, please uh, note that for each panel, I will do just a single introduction of all the panelists in order not to interrupt many times and uh, uh, to keep things uh, fluid and simple. So when the panelists scheduled before you has finished and it's your turn feel free uh, to to speak to to take the floor and as uh, it has been said please remember to switch off your microphone when someone else uh, is speaking the first panel is on the first recommendation responsible conduct through the procurement cycle so basically it contains proposals to promote efficiency in public decision making processes such as uh, the strengthening of uh, administrative capacity, the use of digital tools to increase transparency and collective actions like integrity pacts with the private sector. It will be introduced by a keynote speech from uh, Antonio Matonti, who is the manager of the task force. Then we will listen to the chair of Enel, Michele Crisostomo, followed by Maria Fernanda Garza, CEO of finally Mrs. Uh, Greta Fenner, managing director of the Basel Institute on governance, uh, we start with Mr. Matonti. Please, you have the floor. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Talley. Good morning at all. And uh, welcome, everyone. And thanks for joining us uh, in our event. A special thanks also to the chair of Anti-Corruption Working Group, uh, Mr. Giovanni Tartaglia Pulcini. Concerning this first panel, one of the most uh, uh, vulnerable activities affected by corruption is public procurement, uh, representing almost the majority case of bribes uh, and one of the most recognized high-risk areas for corruption in governments, also according to the OECD analysis. So corruption may substantially erode trust in the public sector uh, to act in the best interest of citizens, contributing uh, to wasting uh, uh, public resources, uh, resulting in poor quality uh, services uh, or infrastructure. Uh, uh, it's useful to consider that the World Economic Forum estimates the global cost of corruption is at least 2.6 trillion of dollars, or the 5% uh, uh, of the global gross domestic product. Moreover, COVID-19 has put unprecedented, uh, unprecedented strain on our economies and uh, public finances, uh, increasing the risk of corruption and fraud. Indeed, the current uh, pandemic and the related emergency uh, scenarios have generated a mandatory condition for governments uh, to take uh, quick decisions and implement uh, drastic measures to protect uh, communities uh, at risk. 
So it's crucial to implement and adopt effective and impactful measures to ensure a responsible conduct through the procurement cycle in order to fight and mitigate corruption phenomena that distort competition and slow down economic development. In this context, the Integrity and Compliance Task Force has proposed dedicated recommendations to this topic. The first recommendation, uh, in fact, underlines uh, how effective uh, in the fight against, uh, against corruption it can be the heightening of efficiency in uh, public decision-making processes through the strengthening of uh, uh, the so-called administrative capaci capacity, which in turn depends on the effectiveness of the system of selection and training of officials uh, in charge of managing tenders. On a parallel rule uh, and on a parallel note, the uh, above mentioned aim can be further reached through uh, an increase in transparency and accountability through the procurement cycle, as well as the leverage of uh, emerging technologies to prevent and detect instances of uh, corruption, thus creating a more competitive and inclusive process uh, by encouraging fair competition. In addition, it's equally fundamental to adopt high quality standards of integrity and compliance programs by enabling, enabling uh, timely uh, access to public information. Another essential uh, element uh, in our point of view is uh, uh, public private cooperation, which can be linked to the so called collective action, such as integrity packs, uh, as you said, Mr. Talley in order to address uh, specific situations of vulnerability. This is a key element, a key point of our uh, document and of our recommendation. As our chair, Mrs. Patrizia Greco said, mentioned before, for each recommendation within the paper, we have identified KPIs in order to monitor the impact of our proposals. For the first recommendation, we identified the Global Corruption Index uh, which mainly uh, relies on two sub-indexes. The first is the measurement of corruption and the, measurement, uh, the second is the measurement of white-collar crimes. The index has a pre-settled de uh, deadline that is in, uh, 2000, in uh, 2020 of uh, uh, 46%, which represents uh, the global level of corruption uh, uh, according to this index. Our target ambition is clearly to uh, reduce the level, this level, bringing it down of uh, 6% points uh, and therefore to score 40% uh, of global level corruption uh, in 2024. So now I leave the floor to our panelists. Uh, and so in order, uh, Mr. Michele Crisostomo, Mrs. Maria Fernanda Garza and Mrs. Uh, Greta Fenner which uh, we further discuss about policy papers uh, first recommendation good morning everybody uh, thank you antonio for this uh, uh, thorough introduction uh, where you have been going through this uh, issue around the uh, corruption uh, within the uh, public administration uh, with the idea that we have been developing during the work in the task force uh, to actually focus on solutions and provide the recommendations. In this connection, I would like to focus essentially on uh, two points which are strictly connected with each other. The first one is how to improve efficiency within the public procurement systems. And uh, the second one is uh, the key advantages for business represented by the digitalization of administrative uh, processes. Mm. Um, especially in this uh, uh, scenario where we are facing uh, a, one of the biggest you know, investment programs in uh, history uh, due to the uh, worldwide reaction to the pandemic, it is absolutely crucial you know, to ensure that the fair and proper use of funding, which means that uh, uh, an issue which is uh, always a very delicate one and a very crucial one, has become today uh, imperative for us to give recommendations and to address it properly. 
Currently, the um, first policy action envisaged by our task force is to improve the efficiency of public administration, especially within public procurement systems. And the efficiency essentially starts from uh, uh, professionalized civil servants working pursuant to ethical standards and the benefit from the digitalization of administrative processes and within a well-designed institutional framework. If we want to elaborate a little bit further on these points, uh, uh, starting from the first one, you know, the most important investment in the public administration, as also uh, Antonio was mentioning uh, before, is the one on social capital. Improving the training of public employees, ensuring upskilling and reskilling, enhancing people through professional growth, boosting managerial skills and digital literacy, stimulating turnover, recruiting uh, new competent staff with technical skills, all of this will contribute to a modern and an efficient public sector. And I would also, would also like to stress uh, uh, the need to inspire younger generations through schools and universities so that we can raise awareness on the opportunities of working in the public sector, spread the importance of a technical scientific culture, increasing the integrated with the, the humanistic dimension. And this combination will definitely be crucial in order to uh, form, to shape a new generation of public servants which will be conscious of the importance of an ethical behavior in uh, any time they will be approaching their, in a way, private counterparties. In this context, of course, we cannot talk about the efficiency of the public administration without uh, talking about its digitalization. The pandemic has shown that uh, businesses which have been starting the uh, digital journey earlier have proven to be more solid, flexible and resilient. In the public sector, the digitalization of administrative processes may help to better prevent and counter corruption since it reduces the manual intervention, ensures that as much interaction as possible is shifted to digital channels and uh, therefore will improve the tracking of the activities provided and the efficiency and the efficacy, efficacy of audit activities in detecting irregularities. You know, the, 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 narrow, the, the, the broader is uh, the discretion of public uh, officials, of course, the wider is the possibility for bribes and corruptions. So digitalization will be making stricter the area for discretion, which will be having a sort of uh, immediate impact in uh, terms of uh, preventing and controlling that uh, corruption is, uh, is reduced. Um, that's why the second policy action, you know, that uh, we've been envisaging in our task force is that of this, that the one of enhancing the, and implementing a digitalization of public uh, administrative processes. And the redefinition of procedures and services in a digital perspective, it will also have the effect of improving access of citizens to data and public services and participation of business, including small and medium enterprises in public tenders. Digitalization is also a tool to simplify the governance of the various entities involved in public procurement and spending, whose complexity in some areas, and of course, we, I can mention the energy area, where this is a phenomenon which have a very, very strong impact on the development of the energy transition, may represent a barrier to unlock the investments needed for the sustainable transition of which the G20 is uh, paving the way. This leads us to broader to the broader governance topic, which, however, will be the subject of the of the of the second panel. And uh, with these uh, considerations, I would uh, leave the floor to the other panelists. And uh, I thank you very much for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for this opportunity to address you today. We commend the organization of this important G20 B20 dialogue today so that governments and business can discuss how we can work together on the implementation of concrete recommendations to increase transparency and fight corruption. I was honored to serve as co-chair of the B20 Integrity Compliance Task Force. I, I brought to this role my experience as CEO of Orestia, a small business in Mexico, and I bring my perspective as first vice chair of the International Chamber of Commerce as the organization's high-level champion on combating corruption. ICC is institutional representative of more than 45 million companies in over 100 countries, with a mission to make business work 
for everyone, every day, everywhere. At ICC, not our commitment to fighting corruption is ingrained in our DNA. In 1977, ICC was the first business organization to develop rules against extortion and bribery. Since then, ICC has taken the lead in denouncing corruption, developing tools to promote integrity and ethics in business, and championing effective legal frameworks to counter corruption globally. It is in this context that we are deeply concerned by emerging evidence that COVID-19 has exacerbated instances of corruption, from increases in counterfeiting and piracy to reports of stimulus funds being misused. Recognizing these risks, in July of last year, ICC issued its guidance on integrity for a resilient response and rebuild after COVID-19, which pointed to the crucial importance of maintaining integrity and transparency in procurement during times of crisis. Preserving the use of due diligence to address risk of corruption and human rights impacts presented by supply chain disruptions. Countering illicit practices in times of crisis, such as counterfeit medicines and medical supplies. Addressing corruption risks related to customs and preserving the rule of law during crisis. Quite clearly, a resilient post-pandemic economy will need to be underpinned by a renewed focus on promoting integrity and good governance. And this will only be possible through enhanced public-private cooperation. We have seen that preserving integrity in the procurement process is key, not just to combat corruption, but also a way of preserving access to business opportunities during this fragile economic time. Digital tools also contribute to increase transparency of procurement processes, and by reducing contact with people also reduces corruption risks. Digital tools can also ease access of SMEs to public tenders. The promotion of public-private compliance programs is an essential part of reducing the integrity risks in the procurement cycle. ICC's expertise in developing integrity and compliance tools by business for business helps companies of all sizes recognize and address integrity risks in the procurement process. These ICC tools are available free and are especially valuable for SMEs that don't have the resources to build large legal and compliance departments. We need to keep in mind that risks in the procurement process involve both supply and demand, and that as a result, compliance programs addressing both government officials and business need to be put in place. In this respect, it is exciting to see that integrity tools ICC developed for businesses are now being used by governments. For example, the North Macedonia government announced last year that from now on, it is using the ICC anti-corruption clause for its government procurement contacts. And the same is happening in the state of Jalisco, Mexico. We also need to put in place strategic approaches to integrity, stepping back from a purely legalistic approach, especially with the disruption of many value chains with COVID-19. It is very important for SMEs sheer survival to get their integrity and compliance processes in place so they can be vetted by the bigger companies and get integrated into their value chains. In closing, only by challenging the status quo and pursuing new, stronger accountability mechanisms can we really move the needle 
in making integrity everyone's business. Without that, there can be no prospect of delivering fully on the sustainable development goals. We see now that the business of business is no longer just doing business itself. Society will only gain ground on the fight against corruption and the challenges presented by the ongoing pandemic through public and private sector joint efforts, such as the ones proposed by our B20 Integrity and Compliance Task Force. ICC, as the institutional representative of 45 million businesses, stands firmly committed to continue to work with all stakeholders to deliver on this shared goal. Thank you. Well, uh, I think it's my turn, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies. Uh, thank you so much for, for having me on this panel. I'd like to um, start by thanking the Italian B20 presidency and in, in particular the Integrity and Compliance Task Force for facilitating uh, what I consider a really important dialogue between the B20 and the G20. I also would like to thank um, the Italian um, group for the very excellent uh, leadership throughout the 2021 cycle and the importance that you assigned to issues of integrity and compliance. I think that uh, providing a platform for this active engagement and exchange is especially important this year. As we heard, uh, there is the new G20 anti-corruption action plan uh, currently being developed, uh, soon to be adopted. And I think providing this kind of opportunity uh, to further align approaches and exchange ideas is particularly impactful and important for topics such as public procurement. And, and why am I saying that? I do believe that every new corruption scandal, and sadly there are still many, um, that hits the headlines and involves uh, a big publicly financed project demonstrates that integrity and transparency makes a lot of sense from a business perspective, but also very, very much from a public investment uh, perspective. So uh, we do have a situation where there is essential shared interest. From the perspective of the private sector, when it comes to, for example, uh, procurement, uh, investors are increasingly asking for companies uh, to demonstrate not only just a vague commitment, as was perhaps still satisfactory 10, uh, 15 years ago, but an actual track record of compliance. At least I would say that's true for those investors that you might want if you're leading a company that is striving for long-term success, which is a combination of adding to the bottom line and adding to the shareholder profit, but also to the public good. And I think one of the earlier speakers uh, spoke about the sustainable business growth issue. Um, every one of these scandals also demonstrates that transparent and responsible conduct in procurement, and here I'm coming back to this shared agenda, is really not a one-way street. It requires the business community and governments to come together and collectively address anti-competitive and corrupt uh, behavior. Companies have understood this for quite some time, are working hard to address the issues, uh, fully acknowledging that it is sometimes easier to talk about it than to follow up with action, but are very committed to do so. And I think the continued work of B20 member companies and organizations in the field of integrity and transparency illustrates that. And that's also why the B20 is repeatedly calling on the G20 to commit to and support the implementation of a multi-stakeholder approach, albeit I will take that advice and perhaps switch my language uh, as uh, suggested by Mr. Polcini earlier to multi-shareholder initiative. So to the implementation of a multi-stakeholder, multi-shareholder approach to promoting integrity in procurements. It's a two-way street, as I said, and that's why collective action, as we like to talk, use uh, as a terminology, is not just the right thing to do, but it's unavoidable. In this sense, over the years, the B20 has continuously advocated for G20 member countries to establish and adopt tools of that nature, of collective action nature, such as integrity pacts or high-level reporting mechanisms, and also for governments to engage in existing such initiatives that facilitate um, transparency and oversight for public projects. For example, uh, you may very well know, I hope, the Infrastructure Transparency Initiative, COST, or the Open Contracting Partnership. 
This is not just about integrity and transparency, as I think we also heard before, but it's very critical to bolster competitiveness and ensure that public funds are invested in a sound matter, manner that yield the results intended for by the concerned governments. Another such tool that I would like to bring to your attention and that the B20 have long advocated for, for which we also hope to gain a lot more uptake by G20 member states is the so-called high level reporting mechanism or HLRM. This, what we consider a very innovative procurement tool was co-developed by the OECD Transparency International and my own organization, the Basel Institute on Governance with support from the Siemens Integrity Initiative. The high level reporting mechanism focuses on early detection and eradication of anti-competitive and corrupt behavior throughout the tendering and award phases of public procurement. It's built primarily, I'm not going to go into detail, but around three key pillars, which I think will, will show how it can really add value. One, it aims to set up a secure and easily accessible communications channel <laughs> through which stakeholders can raise concerns about potential bribery situations in procurement. Second, it is set up very essentially through a collaborative process with contributions from the public sector, business and civil society. This is critical because the mechanism builds on trust and on mutual, mutual trust in particular. And third, what it really aims to do is to provide a rapid and very timely response through a designated independent panel of experts that can quickly assess the alert and gather all necessary information. The quick response of the high level reporting mechanism is extremely important because we don't want a procurement process to be unnecessarily delayed. We want to address any bribery concerns in a preventative manner uh, without unnecessary delay, because otherwise time costs money, as we know. <clears throat> the high-level reporting mechanism is not a set system, which is why I believe there's a wide range of T20 countries that could easily consider its adoption. It's designed to be tailored to the context of each country and project, and we find that it's a very, very flexible tool that can really be adjusted to country context. We have seen some mention and general support for these types of anti-corruption initiatives at the G20, uh, in the G20 documents and at the G20 level, but we sincerely hope that the G20 will consider a much more explicit inclusion of references to such mechanisms in the anti-corruption action plan and we also hope uh, to see the inclusion of concrete activities that include the private sector to strengthen integrity and transparency in procurement in the G20 anti-corruption working group uh, country implementation plans. Ensuring transparency and integrity, and I'm coming to my concluding uh, words, throughout the procurement cycle requires commitment from both sides. And we believe that B20 and the G20 are together uniquely positioned to facilitate a more impactful engagement by leveraging and translating the vast knowledge and experience that both the business community and the G20 member states can bring to the table and to translate it into action and impact on the ground, moving away from the written word to action. We hope and we trust that the call by B20 companies and organizations is heard by the G20 member states and that we can work closely together over the coming years to make these calls and commitments reality. To conclude, can I uh, invite you, if you wish more information on these initiatives and other uh, relevant tools on integrity in public procurement, to visit the B20 Anti-Corruption Collective Action Hub, which is hosted by the Basel Institute, has been hosted by our institution at the request of the B20 for many years. You can find it on our website or simply by Googling the name. I think you'll find it very, very useful and, and relevant for the consultation between G20 and B20 and hopefully inspiring the G20 action plan. Thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to the continued uh, discussion. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mrs. Fenner. We can uh, move on to the second panel now on the second recommendation sustainable governance in a business which contains proposals to ensure that uh, the, the corporate governance contributes to the achievement of uh, sustainability objectives combining uh, remunerations for shareholders with the creating the creation of value to stakeholders we will start again with a keynote uh, from the manager of the task force antonio matonti then uh, we'll take the floor of Katia Bechtel, who leads the Partnering Against Corruption Initiative at the World Economic Forum. 
She will be followed by Alan Johnson, president of the International Federation of Accountants. And finally, we'll meet again Michele Crisostomo, CEO of Enel. Mr. Matonti, you have the floor again, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Pellet. Uh, concerning uh, uh, this second panel, uh, this second recommendation, uh, the reflection from which we started was uh, that uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, has uh, accelerated uh, the focus on global risks uh, such as uh, fragility of economic systems and social inequality, flows occurring in critical infrastructures and uh, uh, public procurement cycles, obviously, assurance in procurement processes and cyber attacks. Uh, in this context, the, the concepts of integrity and compliance are taking uh, on a broader scope in our point of view, posing a necessity of uh, uh, changing the traditional priorities. Uh, 2020 has been a record setting year from, for the growth in sustainable investment, as shown by the uh, global sustainable uh, investing survey uh, carried out by BlackRock. Uh, in more details, uh, uh, 2003 uh, billion of dollars, uh, 203 billion of dollars uh, has flowed uh, into ESG funds uh, in, uh, in uh, 2020. Also, thanks to the global pandemic, which strongly impacted such topic accelerating awareness and interest of investors on ESG matters. There is an incremental need, so there is an incremental need also to embrace new ways of take, tackling emerging issues, which focus on the importance of corporate governance, as well as heightening the level of compliance among organizations, among businesses. The relevance of defining how sustainability uh, can become part of the compliance framework is key. Compliance uh, can uh, help companies to better evolve towards organizational models that are more sensible uh, and respectful uh, with regards to stakeholder interest. In this sense, sustainability and ESG should become crucial for those organizational models uh, mentioned before the, as for other themes such as diversity and inclusion. The second recommendation uh, contains proposal which aim to ensure uh, that the corporate governance contributes to the achievement of uh, uh, sustainability objectives. In concrete terms, measures such as risk assessment, corporate governance choices must now be able to promote an evolutionary process that combines the ability to remunerate shareholder, uh, shareholders wh while creating value also to stakeholders, for stakeholders. Indeed, some tangible steps that organizations uh, should take with respect to uh, leveraging ESG and sustainability programs to build value in the short, mi mid, but long term for all the business ecosystem are embed sustainability in business strategy to manage and measures impact that will support long-term value creations. Uh, second, set new priorities in order uh, to take greater account of stakeholder interest, such as disaster preparedness, continuity planning, employee benefits and social and human rights. Third, implement and adopt proactive measures to manage social and environmental risks across supply chain and organizations. In this process, large enterprises and SOEs are fundamental steps to create a positive leading example to be emulated for the implementation and promotion of good and innovative governance practices. Concerning KPI uh, for the recommendation two, we have identified the business extent of disclosure index which measures the level to which investors are protected through disclosure of ownership and financial information. The source, in this case, is World Bank. The index has a pre-established pre baseline that in the 2020 is of 6 on a scale of 0 to, to 10. Our ambition is clearly to increase this level, aiming for a target of 6.43 in 2024. 
in 2024. Furthermore, we have identified an additional uh, KPI pilot uh, revolving around the concept of sustainable governance, named Governance Core Index from SGI, the Sustainable Governance Indicators. Such key PPI, uh, KPI pilot, relies on two key elements, executive capacity and executive accountability. In such contexts, it's essential the consultation of economic actors in policy definitions, uh, but concerning uh, such uh, key PPI is necessary a commitment from, go from governments to complete this index uh, through the participation in dedicated assessment because uh, currently only uh, 12 G20 members are in the uh, assessment process of this, of this index. The baseline for the key PPI has been settled based on 2020 data, which is uh, 6.4, and the relative target in uh, 2024 is expected to be 7.1. Now, uh, thank you, and I leave the floor to our panelists. Thank you very much, Antonio. My name is Katja Bechtel from the World Economic Forum Partner Against Corruption Initiative. Also from my side, uh, thank you for the organizers for, um, uh, for uh, initiating this very important dialogue. Indeed, um, that the G20 and the B20 collaborate closely and talk to each other frequently is um, of utmost importance. Well, our second recommendation on uh, sustainable governance in business. I think it's, um, it's a key one because it maps out like the beyond compliance space. It is very important because as it was said, as it was said before, it's about the alignment of interests of companies, shareholders, stakeholders and society at large. And this is good for business too. There's research which shows very clearly that companies that perform very well on sustainability factors outperform their peers and sustainable investment is skyrocketing. So these are all good reasons for promoting sustainable governance. And of course, it's important to contribute to achieving the sustainable development goals. But how do we make it happen? How do we implement sustainable governance? I think there are internal factors and external factors as usual. I think internally for companies, it will be key to establish a strong culture of integrity, or maybe now we need to say a strong culture of integrity in a virtual world or in an increasingly virtual world. Uh, this will be very important, but it is a long-term effort. Um, establishing a culture means that a company and organization needs to be open to continuous learning, to continuous to improvement, and there will be no size well, no one size fits all approach to establishing a culture of integrity. But there are some, some key components, such as the alignment of incentives, so they do not contradict each other, and that they really work towards ethical behavior. It's important to have a strong speak up culture. So, employees, which are usually intended to do the right thing, have the psychological safety to speak up not after something has happened, but before something is, happen is happening. And of course, as usual, the tone from the top, strong, uh, visible leadership will be important for establishing a culture of integrity and to achieve sustainable governance. When it comes more to the business environment, I think we have seen um, the development of ESG frameworks um, over the last years, and a lot of important work has been done, including by the World Economic Forum, and this is like really, really important guidance for companies in terms of mapping out and understanding what sustainable governance means. They, these um, frameworks are important for establishing a common language and a common understanding. And this is why our task force strongly believes that we should harmonize and standardize um, these frameworks on, on ESG reporting. It will also mean less um, burden with regard to reporting requirements, but it will also um, enable important uh, comparability between reporting entities. So harmonization, standardization of ESG frameworks is, um, is very important. But let me also mention that um, when we look at ESG frameworks today, um, there needs to be more effort in strengthening the G ESG and particularly to strengthen anti-corruption. At the moment, there is not um, a clear consensus, consensus about what the G actually constitutes in ESG. 
and also corruption is sometimes treated as um, an optional issue and that cannot be the case because good governance and anti-corruption is key for, uh, for achieving the other sustainability goals and without it we will not make progress on the E or the S of ESG. So just to conclude, um, this is a forward-looking recommendation, sustainable governance in business. And if sustainable governance is founded on a strong culture of integrity and guided by a standardized, standardized ESG reporting with a strong focus on the G, we will make a very important contribution to achieving the sustainable development goals. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to all. Thank you, Madam Chair Emma Machigalia, the Integrity Compliance Task Force Chair Patrizia Grieco, Honorable Minister Luigi Di Maio, and the G20 Anti Corruption Working Group Chair Giovanni Polcini for your opening remarks. And also thank you, Antonio Mantonti, for introducing this panel session. I also thank the B20 Secretariat and the Integrity and Compliance Task Force for the invitation to speak today in my capacity as President and Chair of the Board of the International Federation of Accountants, or IFAC. IFAC is the global voice of the accountancy profession, representing more than 3 million professional accountants through our 180 member bodies in 135 countries, including, of course, Consiglio Nazionale dei Dottori Commercialisti e degli Esperti Contabili in Italy, a very important member body. IFAC and the global accountancy profession that we represent has a strong interest in all of the topics covered by the Integrity and Compliance Task Force. Integrity and transparency in the public sector, for example, are important priorities for us and will be addressed in IFAC's annual G20 call to action coming out later this week. That said, I'm here today to highlight our strong support for the task force finding in the draft recommendation 2.2 that to encourage better ESG practices, standardized non-financial reporting is key. And Katia has just mentioned that. We believe the time for a global so solution for sustainability reporting is now, it's here. This is necessary to answer the demand from investors, from policymakers and other stakeholders for a reporting system that delivers consistent, comparable, reliable, and assurable information relevant to enterprise value creation, to sustainable development and the evolving expectations of society. A fragmented approach perpetuates inefficiency, increased costs, and most of all, a lack of trust. I would like to emphasize that this system must be global as we simply cannot achieve our sustainability targets with governments acting alone. And this was emphasized so clearly in Minister Di, Di Maio's comments. We need to leverage the immense power of the private sector and on investors. To do this, we need high quality and comparable information about sustainable development's impacts on companies, but also on the company's impacts on sustainable development and on society at large. And I believe strongly that companies exist to serve all stakeholders and only by doing so will they deliver sustainable value. Fortunately today, there's significant momentum to develop this global system. We believe that establishing an International Sustainability Standards Board or IWSB under the IFRS Foundation is the best way forward. We have heard this from important stakeholders, such as the G7 and the G20, central banks and finance ministers, the network for greening the financial system, and from individual G20 countries. The IFRS Foundation has a proven record, a clear connection to and integration with financial reporting. It has international legitimacy and uniquely the ability to develop world-class standards that are widely adopted across the world. And this is not just an issue for large companies. Small and medium-sized enterprises are central to this discussion. SMEs account for over 70% of total employment and 50% of GDP. But in 
the less developed countries, the SMEs share of employment and national GDP is even higher. So SMEs play an important and critical role in the global economy. In 2018, IFAC and Business and OECD published a study that found that the global cost of regulatory fragmentation was about $780 billion annually. This cost, unfortunately, disproportionately falls on the SMEs. So sustainability reporting, as it emerges, can either be a success in averting regulatory uh, fragmentation or another lost opportunity. Hence the need for a truly global system for sustainability reporting. So with that, I would like to thank the chairs, distinguished guests and the organizers for the opportunity to speak today. I thank Italy for leading the G20 this year and wish you much, much success at your next meeting in October. IFAC commits to continue working closely with the B20 and advocate through the G20 to promote and enhance sustainable governance, increase transparency and fighting corruption across the whole economy. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alan. And uh, thank you, all the fellow panelists. And uh, um, I would like to uh, talk about what uh, also Anna mentioned as a criterion which is pretty key in addressing the sustainability issue, which is proportionality. You know, starting from uh, how important it is uh, to, uh, especially over the next decade, uh, to um, to put the massive investments across all sectors uh, in order to boost the transition to a sustainable economy. As we all know, asset managers are increasingly looking at ESG quality and information on the back of a strong client interest in sustainable investing. And uh, this of reflects the, the shift from a, a, a stakeholder, a, for, sorry, from a shareholder uh, primacy type of uh, capitalism towards a stakeholder capitalism model. And the, the, this interest in ESG issues is growing and will intensify in the future also due to the increase of institutional investors in the ownership structure of the world's listed companies. And uh, coherently, the importance of sustainability is increasingly being recognized either in legal instruments, we have seen uh, the EU directives on shareholders' rights and the non-financial reporting and the new proposal for uh, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, and in soft law, uh, like you know, we, we all think of the voluntary corporate governance codes. And along this pathway, the task force on integrity and compliance proposes to define how sustainability can become part also of the compliance framework, which is what in our task force has been really putting at the center of our discussions. Because a sound compliance system should also relate to ESG issues, including corporate governance, health and safety, human rights, environment, contrast to financial crime and corruption. And adopting, I come to the proportionality point, adopting a proportionality approach, the legal and soft law instruments that embed the sustainability often articulate recommendations according to company size and ownership structure. For instance, the largest companies are called to highest standard of transparency in the EU. They are required to publish regular reports on the social and environmental impacts of their activities, including treatment of employees, respect for human rights, anti-corruption and bribery. Information is extended to the due diligence processes, also regarding the supply chains. State-owned companies, the SOEs, that they usually run complex businesses in sectors of strategic importance and are often involved in cross-border activities, are called to follow international agreed standards to operate efficiently, transparently, and in an accountable manner. So this proportionality approach is consistent with the idea that the largest and multinational companies due to globalization have gained unprecedented power and influence across the world and should thus make efforts to increase their positive impact and minimize the negative effects on the host communities, stakeholders, and the sustainable development. In particular, many multinationals may actually drive development and create jobs and can actually prevent the risk of corruption and harmful impacts on their activities, e.g. by improving transparency regarding their local suppliers and working together with them to improve human and labor rights compliance. In this context, large enterprises and the SOEs are particularly encouraged to step up to this role 
in order to create a positive leading example to be emulated, as we have been recognizing during the work of our task force. These companies can show that places of sustainability at the center of the strategy does not respond to ethical or moral issues only, but is the right way to create value, to manage risks, to allow to operate in the long term and respond to high expectations of customers, employees, and the communities where the company operates as a whole. The supply chain plays an essential role in helping those companies to achieve their goals. Each strategy begins upstream of a corporation's activities. This is precisely from the planning of these activities in which it will invest and for which it will award supplies. For companies that embed sustainability in their strategy, this means that their suppliers are asked not only to mitigate the risks and improve efficiency, but also, above all, to share a sustainability project. Virtual suppliers which share high standards of compliance, safety, quality of work, environment, human rights and the ability to innovate in a sustainable way should consequently be, a, be accompanied in their growth through a common and shared effort. The effort required to suppliers will be compensated by their higher resiliency, innovation and growth. The effort required to the corporations that lead the supply chain will be compensated by the achievement of the sustainability strategy. Here we have a virtuous, uh, egoistic push that can become the most powerful instrument through the uh, supply chains to spread the sustainability culture and therefore to uh, make it for the benefit of the communities as a whole. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Chrysostomo. Now let's move to the third panel on the third recommendation of the task force, cooperative compliance models and rewarding systems. So it aims to strengthen the effectiveness of the public-private cooperation to combat illegality and corruption, and to strengthen the centrality of rewarding mechanisms such as leniency programs and collective actions. The panel will be introduced by a keynote speech from Valentino Ianieri, Deputy Chair of the Task Force. Then we will have Britta Niemeyer, who leads the Global Business Integrity Program at the Transparency International, followed by Maria Fernanda Garza, CEO of Orestia, and finally, Nicola Locca, Vice Chair of the Anti-Corruption Committee at Business and Industry Advisory Committee of OECD. Mr. Ianieri, you have the floor. Thanks, uh, Mr. Talley, and thanks to the distinguished panelists for their valuable contribution. Now let's move on to the third recommendation, cooperative models and rewarding system. As task force, we are convinced that integrity and compliance should become milestones for organizations. There is a strong need to foster dialogue, enhance cooperation, trust and strategic alignment between public and private organizations, stimulating and rewarding voluntary management commitments while considering the enrichment of the understanding of associated risk profiles through measures such as due diligence policies and third-party risk management. Therefore, especially in this moment of unprecedented challenges, there is an essential need to build a sustainable culture of integrity and inclusiveness, aiming at better responding to the race of pandemic challenges. In this context, the external ecosystems plays a key role in organizations promoting and stimulating a global culture of sustainable integrity through specific voluntary management commitment. Corporate compliance, strong corporate culture and business ethics are prerequisites for the sustainability of each company. This panel focuses on the development of compliance model and rewarding system. It contains proposals to strengthen the link between the effectiveness of such cooperation and the dissemination of programs and measures to combat illegality and corruption. It also highlights the centrality of reward mechanisms, such as leniency program and again, collective action, also in terms of disseminating best practices and of public-private cooperation. Indeed, it is important that governments act providing incentives for business to establish compliance program by taking into consideration the existence of such programs when awarding public contracts, recognizing effectiveness and performance. Furthermore, to make 
both risk mapping and the enforcement of compliance model effective, whistleblower can play a crucial role in the fight against corruption and in building integrity. Moreover, encouraging corporate compliance efforts contribute to fulfill and support the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and especially SDG number 16, which deals with peace, justice, as strong institutions, with particular reference to target 16.5 of this goal, which is substantially reduce corruption and bribery in all their forms. One of the problems in fighting corruption often resides in the need of proper KPIs. This is why for the recommendation tree, cooperative compliance models and rewarding system, we have identified an index related to countries with national laws protecting whistleblowers elaborated by the Environmental Law Institute. Such index aims at assessing both countries having adopted dedicated whistleblower protection laws and countries with other national laws or provisions protecting whistleblowers. The relative index has a baseline in 2017 of 32 countries with dedicated whistleblower protection laws. And our ambition is to see around 54 countries, so 22 more countries with dedicated laws in this regard by 2024. Let me now leave the floor to our panelists, Mrs. Brittany Meyer, Maria Fernanda Garza, and Mr. Nicola Alloca. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much, Valentino, for introducing the topic. Uh, my focus will be on reinforcing the concept of reward by fostering collective trust. Before I would like to share with you um, perhaps one concrete practical example that aims to illustrate how better private public cooperation uh, could work in practice. And let me start with a question. And the question is what if? What if the public and the private sector work together or even better complement each other in the prevention and detection of corruption? not only and primarily because it's a regulatory requirement um, to foresee um, effective uh, measures, uh, tools, elements in order to prevent and detect corruption, but perhaps because also it is just common sense. Uh, why could it be common sense? Because it's to the benefit of all parties involved to have access to information, to exchange information, to exchange lessons learned and to exchange experiences on good practice standards because nobody needs to reinvent wheels when it comes to a proper implementation of compliance programs. We as Transparency International, we acknowledge maturity, increasing the levels of maturities when it comes to the implementation of compliance programs and um, also discussions in our B20 Integrity Compliance Task Force left uh, a huge impression on me. And people understand. People understand compliance is not a legal topic that can be delegated to a certain support function. It's a leadership issue. And therefore, I would like to briefly focus um, on COVID-19. As mentioned before, we are speaking about a really major global threat. At the same time, the COVID-19 situation and its recovery creates momentum, which is quite unique uh, for a coordinated response. Why? Um, it was a pandemic, still is a pandemic with unforeseen speed. Integrity might have not always been at the forefront, might not always have been a priority. Um, perhaps there was a tendency to circumcise internal controls. Perhaps there might have been an increased risk to take shortcuts. And last but not least, we are speaking about huge amounts of public funds. Conclusion number one, there is no time to relax uh, when it comes to the fight against corruption. Conclusion number two, organizations are not technical machines, no matter if we are speaking about public or private organizations. We are not talking about technical machines we are speaking about human beings. Um, and therefore, conclusion number three, formal tick the box approaches will continue to be neither help nor convincing in practice. 
Um, a few thoughts and reflections on the topic rewards. Because again, the overall headline of this intervention is reinforcing the concept of reward by fostering collective trust. Again, I would like to raise some questions when it comes to rewards. What is the criteria to become a manager, a director, a vice president, a senior vice president? Perhaps even more important, what are expected behaviors that earn a person said title? what technical, what leadership skills are required, and perhaps a little bit more precise when it comes to public and private sector procedures, and again, uh, public tenders, what are criteria to convince in public tenders? Hopefully competitive, transparent bidding criteria. Therefore, I would like to share with you one uh, practical solution that has been mentioned before in the context of procurement cycles that also plays an important role uh, in our policy recommendations this year as part of cooperative measures, integrity pacts. What are, again, integrity pacts? We are speaking about frameworks for governments, for businesses and civil society to collaborate and ensure all together that authorities and bidders practically address corruption risks and therefore foster public trust. In a nutshell, we believe in the effectiveness of bringing together different perspectives. Corruption is a huge thing. The fight against corruption is a huge thing. Therefore, cooperation and collective action are key factors for success. Thank you so much. Thank you, Greta, and thank you, Valentina. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to join you on this very important panel on cooperative compliance models and rewarding systems. As co-chair of the B20 Task Force of Integrity and Compliance and as ICC high-level champion for anti-corruption, I can say we place a strong importance on these recommendations calling for government recognition of compliance programs and for best practices of public-private cooperation. As we have heard through today's dialogue, the only way to make real, concrete, sustainable progress is with governments and business working together. This means government's positive recognition by offering leniency and reduced penalties to companies that have in place anti-corruption programs and cultures of integrity and governments need to recognize and incentivize in this way voluntary business efforts for integrity and compliance. ICC is a pioneer in leader in building companies' capacity through integrity tools and compliance programs. Many companies have made great progress in implementing these programs and putting in place due diligence policies and third-party risk management to manage relationship with their supply chain. These all work together to build a culture of integrity and intolerance for corruption. In this context, designing and implementing whistleblowing systems by many as contributing to an enabling environment for integrity and as a result for sustainable growth. We should note here that the G20 high-level principles for whistleblower protection were very important in signaling the need for more harmonized standards for whistleblowing reporting. And as we know, the EU Directive for Whistleblowing Protection of 2018 introduced minimum standards for the protection of whistleblowers in the EU, which companies and authorities there must follow. But while the EU is important, it is not just one part of the world. ICC, the International Chamber of Commerce, was prescient in developing its first guidelines for whistleblowing in 2008. And we are proud to be updating these guidelines now with the launch plan soon of this new voluntary global standard that takes into account these recent developments. While the ICC new whistleblowing guidelines are still being developed, 
we are hearing from member companies that there seems to be a move towards a broader application of whistleblower systems, not just to reporting, but to also foster dedicated communication channels to raise awareness and to exchange with employees on broader issues such as health, safety, or the environment. And consideration is being given in ICC's new whistleblowing guidelines for a wider definition of the type of wrongdoing that can be reported and not just corruption per se. Now, it is very important here to note that protection of the whistleblower or reporting person from retaliation is absolutely essential for any successful, for successful whistleblowing system. We have seen that while protection under whistleblower protection laws is mostly provided to those reporting misconduct externally to competent authorities, in reality, private sector employees report first if at all, inside the company. And we have seen that non-retaliation policy alone, without a system to ensure re its respect, such as disciplinary action against those who retaliate, is unlikely to encourage reporting. So we need to have not just strong G20 encouragement of the adoption and implementation of whistleblowing reporting systems, but also protection of the reporting person from retaliation, including for whistleblower reporting within their company. In some, in these times of unprecedented challenge, corporate compliance through tools and programs, including whistleblowing reporting systems, play a key role in building a sustainable culture of integrity and inclusiveness. As business, we will continue to push ahead in implementing these integrity programs. And we look to the G20 putting support of corporate compliance at the top of its agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Garza. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Talley and Mr. Ianieri for uh, the introduction. I would like to thank Confindustria and uh, Madam Chair, uh, Mrs. Marcegaglia for organizing and hosting this event. And also Mrs. Patrizia Grieco and Antonio Matunti for steering the, B the B20 Integrity and Compliance Task Force in a very effective manner, a task force which I am proud to be a member of. I will start by highlighting an opportunity for the public sector. Private companies have made and are still making great progress in implementing and improving compliance programs driven by changing legal requirements and growing awareness that ethics and compliance is in the best interest of the business as part of the broader concept of responsible business conduct. In this context, private sector companies can share with the public actors the experience and the knowledge they have acquired in the implementation of effective compliance programs and controls. One concrete example is the B20 Argentina OECD Compliance Without Borders Initiative, which brings uh, experienced compliance experts from the private sector via short-term secondments to SOEs to help them build their compliance capacity and address corruption-related risk. Another opportunity could be to structure and deliver, deliver specific training to public officials held by subject matter experts. Collective action efforts with companies, including small and medium enterprises, can further help to foster proactively progress in the fight against corruption, for instance, by identifying ways to effectively eliminate facilitation payments, foster business codes of conduct, and increase the use of digital technologies in compliance contexts, just to name a few examples. 
We therefore strongly appreciate the explicit calls on G20 governments to adopt legal and guidance frameworks supportive of collective action activities with a view to enhance the exchange of best practice and the development of information sharing methods. Good cooperation between public and private sectors can also mean that governments support businesses in their efforts of setting up and stepping up corporate compliance programs, providing an enabling policy environment. One way in which this can be achieved is by providing positive recognition of effective anti-corruption and compliance systems, for instance, by considering them as a plus in public tenders or when awarding other public advantages. In particular, such government encouragement may be to support the adoption of new digital technologies which hold the potential of being game changers in the fight against corruption. Yet, it is critical to ensure that flexibility is maintained and that criteria do not exempt SMEs from accessing public benefits. We underline it is essential to ensure uh, uh, small and medium enterprise buy-in. SMEs are the backbones of our economies, uh, but at the same time, they often face tight resource constraints. It is therefore essential to make sure SMEs are not overloaded by policies that are not adapted to their capacities, and to make sure they develop their own tailored ethics and compliance and due diligence programs and uh, support them by offering training, defining clear expectations and providing targeted guidance. As part of their compliance effort, companies have also gained ex extensive experience in designing and implementing due diligence policies. Expectations and legal requirements are changing and companies are well aware that sound due diligence can help ensure smooth operation, constructive employee engagement and boost resilience and productivity. To that end, we underlined the importance of the call to the G20 to encourage companies to conduct and continuously improve risk-based due diligence also by using smart solutions. As a risk and compliance director of a large Italian company, I can confirm that this is top priority. In conclusion, it is evident how the social role of each organization is becoming critical going forward, and that cooperative models and practices need to be continuously streamlined across all sectors and geographies. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Alloca. We can uh, move on to our uh, uh, last panel on the fourth recommendation of the task force, beneficial ownership transparency with uh, proposals to strengthen the transparency of beneficial owners, the effectiveness of information exchange mechanism, and the accuracy of uh, public registers and their accessibility by control authorities. We will start again with the keynote uh, of Valentino Ianieri, Deputy Chair of the Integrity and Compliance Task Force, followed by Klaus Moosmeier, member of the Executive Committee and Chief Ethics, Risk and Compliance Officer at uh, uh, Novartis. The next will be uh, Katia Bechtel, who leads the Partnering Against Corruption Initiative at the, the World Economic Forum. And finally, Andrew Wilson, Head of Policy Department at the International Chamber of Commerce. Mr. Ianieri, the floor is yours again. Thanks. Thanks again, Mr. Uh, Mr. Talley. So let's move on to the last uh, recommendation, beneficial ownership uh, transparency. The United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, UNODC, estimates between US 800 billion and US 2 trillion of laundered money, much of which passes through anonymous companies. To fight anonymous shell companies that contribute to enabling corruption, fraud, organized crime and tax evasion, it is key to transform beneficial ownership transparency into an inescapable legal requirement. More jurisdictions are requiring companies to disclose information on their actual or beneficial owners in order to make this information available to law enforcement or to the general public. However, in some countries, accessing information on the real owners of companies can still be challenging. 
making more of this information available, for example, by implementing digital public national registers to those who can use it effectively is key. Thus, can, can truly help solve issues around corporate accountability and illicit financial flows. So in this panel, we will focus on the development and implementation at an international and multi-stakeholder level of policies on beneficial ownership transparency, as well as the establishment of public registers, since it can for sure ease the actions of domestic, foreign and international law enforcement agencies and tax authorities to gather free and immediate access to the related data, therefore contributing to competitiveness and risk reduction. A greater attention must be placed on vulnerable industries that are being even more affected by the current scenario. As a way of example, the sports industry, a lack of transparency, render it essential to focus on fighting opaque ownership structures while enhancing beneficial ownership transparency in its entities. The same problems often affect health system and their supply chains. Additional efforts are still needed from governments, both for the creation and proper man maintenance of registers, a process in which the so-called gatekeepers can contribute and whose cooperation is a key factor in combating criminal practices associated with money laundering. For the recommendation number four, concerning beneficial ownership transparency, we have identified an indicator related to worldwide commitments and actions. Countries are fully committed to beneficial ownership transparency, which has been elaborated by open ownership. The identified KPI aims at assessing worldwide commitments and actions undertaken by countries with regards to beneficial ownership transparency, where full commitment to measures, such as in this case, open registers are in operation. The KPI reports a given baseline, baseline as of 2020, which reports of 48 countries to be fully committed to beneficial ownership transparency, those having implemented measures such as open registers. In this context, our ambition is to reach a target of 83 countries to be fully committed to beneficial ownership transparency and its measures. So, 35 more countries by 2024. Now I'll leave the floor to our panelists, Mr. Klaus Mosmeyer, Mrs. Katia Bechtel, and Mr. Andrew Wilson. Yeah, thank you. Um, I believe Valentino Iannetti very much has uh, shown us and talked to us about the importance of beneficial ownership transparency in the fight against corruption. There will be no effective fight against corruption, corruption if we don't have transparency in this regard. Now, why was this and is this important and high on the agenda on the B20? Because it's a collaborative approach. The KPIs, uh, Mr. Neri just mentioned, we put in our policy paper, can only be achieved by a true collaboration between the private and the public sector and the civil society. If you look back and reflect a little bit on beneficial ownership transparency, this topic is on the agenda of the G20 and the B20 since several years. I remember very well when we in 2017 under my chairmanship in Germany under the B20 had intense discussions in the B20 group and put specific proposals into our policy paper. And yes, progress has been achieved. We see more countries coming forward with transparency and legislation, but we still see a siloed approach, approach different legal concepts on access and potential legal remedies around access, for beneficial ownership, transparency. And therefore, we believe what the B20 Italy approach has as a great impact is this focus on key performance indicators to move the needle forward. And we can do this. As much as we have suffered from the COVID-19 situation, we have seen how powerful technology can be to bring fast support to communities 
in need. To uplift our school system within a few couples of months. If we apply the same rigor and impact also in compliance, in transparency legislation, we can move the needle definitely. And it's also very important for public procurement, which again is a joint responsibility. We need trained public officials. We need good also IT platforms, transparent platforms for public procurement. And beneficial ownership transparency plays here a big role. For all the good reasons, so much emergency money was put into the COVID-19 situation to ease the pain, to get support. But at the same time, we need to know who is involved, who are the owners of the corporations involved. Is the clarity the public procurement side, how controls are implemented and conducted? Again, one, one reflection back to the B20 Saudi Arabia approach. We proposed back then a technology kind of roadmap going forward. We also mentioned the concept of a global value chain passport, which could be used also for transparency purposes around beneficial ownership and global procurement. So let us really now scale and focus together public sector, private sector, NGOs, as we're all part of society, how we get now really speed and traction into beneficial ownership transparency. Thank you very much. And move forward to Katja, I believe, right? Yes, thank you, Klaus. Um, thank you for having the opportunity again to, to speak on this important topic. Indeed, Klaus has mentioned it, we have achieved something and it was quite impressive to see over the last uh, 10 years or so the concerted push by business, civil society and governments to achieve beneficial ownership transparency as a key tool to fight corruption and other crimes. However, uh, we have also seen uh, many commitments. We have seen commitments by the G20 in 2016, high level principles. Um, we have also seen a very important and very, I think, um, impressive um, example of business leadership just last week when six of the largest extractive companies have made a strong commitment to beneficial ownership transparency and to public registers. However, this is all um, very positive, but especially when it comes to, um, to the G20, which uh, leads the, um, uh, the, the biggest economies around the world, it's important to move towards implementation. We have seen some good leadership on implementation from some G20 countries, but I think we need to see implementation and reinforced efforts on implementation across the board, across all G20 countries. And I really hope and uh, the G20 Anti-Corruption Action Plan, which is uh, now being discussed, can make a very strong yeah, a commitment, uh, I would say, towards implementation and really show the way how we can achieve implementation so uh, we can also achieve the very ambitious um, goals that the KPIs of our task force has set. Um, one more word maybe on the importance of public registers. Um, the B20 task force has um, advocated for public registers since the Argentine presidency and I think the establishment of digital public registers, which is um, now giving the increasing role of dig uh, digital technology, like uh, the way forward, um, it, it's very important from a business perspective because it enables all businesses, be they large or small, to have the same access to this type of information. It's important for due diligence processes, specifically supply chain due diligence, um, if the information in public registers is of high quality and is continuously updated, then this can be a huge support for mitigating supply chain risk. And obviously, and it was said, uh, businesses want to know who else they are doing business with, who else is bidding for procurement contracts. So these are all good arguments um, for public registers. And, and we hope that the G20 can also move in that direction. What is also important is the standardization of information that is being collected. Um, this will obviously not only reduce the reporting burdens on company, but it will also increase the usability of the data. 
and it will make the, the data more interoperable. So we can connect different data sets um, across countries and that will, um, uh, will help tremendously with addressing beneficial ownership transparency um, in this regard. Um, last but not least, and it was also mentioned by Klaus Mosmeyer before, the importance of, of collaboration of all stakeholders with regard to implementation. But let me mention specifically when it comes to the business sector, the role and responsibility of gatekeepers in that regard. I think gatekeepers, um, whether they are bankers, lawyers, um, art dealers, real estate agents, are in a strategic position to collect beneficial ownership information and to, uh, to flag issues of non-disclosure. So we think it's crucial to engage gatekeepers better in, um, the, in the implementation of beneficial ownership transparency to better harness the expertise and the experience they have in their regard and to encourage proactive systems to evaluate and address entities that do not exist close beneficial ownership information. At the World Economic Forum, we have a cross-sectoral initiative uh, that we, uh, uh, where we are working together with gatekeepers on solutions, and we believe this will be um, key uh, for um, realizing beneficial ownership translation. So thank you very much. Uh, for giving me the floor a second time. And um, thank you. I pass on to the next speaker. Thank you, Katia. Um, just to say hello to everyone, my name is Andrew Wilson. I'm the Global Policy Director at the International Chamber of Commerce. Uh, you've already had the pleasure uh, and the honor of listening to our first Vice Chair, Maria Fernanda Garza, already, and I'll be very brief in my comments today. First of all, as ICC, just to say we fully support the direction of travel of the B20 on beneficial ownership transparency this year, and really think there's particular merit in some of the recommendations around standardization, information exchange, and as mentioned by one of the panelists earlier, um, the establishment of, if you like, key performance indicators. The one thing I'd say from an ICC perspective is these have to be solutions that work for the real economy. So yes, eliminating corruption, tax evasion, fraud, and other forms of financial crime, but also solutions that allow intermediaries such as banks, for instance, to be able to differentiate easily between legitimate law-abiding businesses and those involved in illicit activities of some kind. And we still see this as a major challenge. And I was struck several months ago by a report by the European Financial Stability Board on risks within the financial sector in the context of COVID-19, which concluded that 15 years on from the financial crisis, policymakers and regulators had no greater visibility on risks and threats within the financial system and the interrelationship of those threats than they did at the peak of the financial crisis in 08, 09. So clearly we've got a long way to go still in terms of enhancing meaningful transparency within the economy. And that's why we think an important focus should be on effective implementation. And just to share two quick thoughts there. The first is, can we finally start to see progress in getting all companies, regardless of size, sector or geography, to implement or to adopt legal uh, uh, entity identifiers or digital legal entity identifiers? Clearly, this is a very, very important solution, but uptake of the G20 endorsed framework has been remarkably slow. So can we see some effort to actually accelerate the adoption uh, of the GLIFE framework in the real economy at genuine scale. Second, and I think it, it speaks to what Katya mentioned earlier, is the importance of harmonization and consistency, particularly when it comes to digital solutions. And one uh, thing we see in particular through an initiative we're running out of our Singapore office, the ICC Digital Standards Initiative, is that the benefits of digital solutions from a scalability uh, perspective are often significantly diminished or held back by growing fragmentation of various proprietary solutions. So I think in this area, in particular, it is absolutely vital that the G20, but also other economies walk the same path and ensure common standards, interoperable standards for data exchange and disclosure, first of all, to 
ease the burden on corporates themselves, but also to make sure that we can apply solutions at scale globally and establish global data sets. So that's all from our side. Very much support what the B20 is doing. Very much encourage policymakers to really focus on meaningful implementation and to have digital solutions front of mind, but really to emphasize the importance of interoperability in those solutions. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Our event is almost finished, but uh, we still have room for uh, closing remarks. So at first, uh, I would like to ask Mr. Insan Fami to take the floor. Mr. Fami is the acting director of the fostering networks between commissions and institutions of the KPK, the Corruption Eradication Commission of Indonesia, which is the country that will hold the G20 presidency next year. So this is a sort of a handover between uh, Italy and Indonesia. Mr. Fami, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Emma, Patricia, all panelists and my B20 colleagues. First of all, please allow me to thank B20 chair for inviting me to speak in this B20 G20 dialogue. I do believe that all of us have obtained a fruitful discussion from the panels. In this regard, I would like to express my appreciation to all panelists for delivering their important and interesting work, as well as the participants for their valuable contribution. Distinguished colleagues, the G20 Anti-Corruption Working Group believe that anti-corruption uh, efforts require a holistic strategy and a multi-stakeholder approach. We are strengthening our partnership with individuals and groups outside the public sector, including the private sector, academia, and civil society. The private sector is an essential partner of government on the, in the fight of corruption and its commitment to transparency and integrity plays an integral role in achieving anti-corruption goals. The G20 has long recognized that corruption and bribery impose a heavy price on international business and society as a whole. Therefore, since the establishment of G20 Anti-Corruption Working Group in 2010, we have developed a shared sectoral and a cross-cutting initiative, resulting in the establishment of G20 high-level principle, sharing of experiences and compendium of good practices in a number of areas, guidelines, call to action that helps G20 countries to take national action and support international cooperation. This to me is colleagues, with regard to, be, to the uh, B20 policy uh, recommendation 2021, there were a number of important and interesting points raised. First, we would like to take this opportunity to support your policy paper particularly with regards to foster integrity and transparency through the procurement cycle, promote pu public-private partnership to enhance compliance, corporate compliance effort in private sector, as well as the recommendation related to beneficiary or ownership uh, transparency. As we are recovering from the COVID-19 COVID pandemic, the private sector plays a major role in rebuilding uh, uh, societies and economies with integrity, one size fit all approach. Emphasize on specific elements will vary from one business to another, depending on among other factors. The particular risk engendered by the business. A business may to consider seeking advice from compliance or other professionals to learn more about what kind of uh, internal controls and ethics and compliance program it most appropriate, appropriate for its business and the jurisdiction where it operates. This to Ms. College, with regard to the Indonesian presidency in 2022, we certainly hope that next year B20 policy recommendation will be aligned with our priorities under the Indonesian presidency next year. G20 Anti-Corruption Working Group will continue to promote integrity throughout our recovery 
as we receive, as we strengthen our anti-corruption system and institution. Using lessons learned from the pandemic to foster stable economic growth and the development in the future. Therefore, our priorities for the G20 anti-corruption working group will be focusing on transparency and accountability in both public and private sector. We must take it upon ourselves to ensure that every building block of our social and economic system is operating as efficiently and ethically as possible. One of the most relevant topics that Indonesia wants to raise as a priority issue next year is the role of audit in combating corruption, not only in public sector, but also in private sector. We intend to promote an effective legal basis and framework from, for, for private sector in maintenance of both of books and records financial statement disclosures, accounting and auditing, including sufficient internal auditing controls to assist in preventing, detecting, and response act of corruption. One of the highlights of these priorities issues is that we want to encourage G20 countries to enhance the capacities of internal auditors, including their audit skills, understanding of business process knowledge, strategic and critical thinking related to anti-corruption aspect of their audit program as well as their capacity to use ICTs. Distinguished college, we believe that the outcome from today's discussion will be very important to the next step that priorities issue development that we, as next G20 presidency, are currently working on. We sincerely hope that the engagement and cooperation between G20 anti-corruption working group and B20 is getting closer and stronger. I thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Fami. Now, a final uh, remarks uh, with uh, Mrs. Patrizia Grieco, Chair of MPS, but also Chair of the Integrity and Compliance Task Force. Please, Mrs. Grieco. Uh, more than uh, remarks, uh, I am uh, here to thank you all uh, for your uh, participation. Uh, let me thank you. Uh, let me really thank um, our, the minister, our minister for foreign affairs, Mr. Di Maio, for his message, and uh, thank you also to Mr. Uh, thank, many thanks also to Mr. Tartaglia um, Porcini, chair of the anti-corruption working group. Uh, with which uh, we really had a successful uh, cooperation. Uh, we fully appreciate uh, the efforts of the anti-corruption working group with particular reference uh, um, to the improvement of the quality of corruption indicator, indicators uh, through the growing recourse uh, to uh, reliable indicators uh, both in public and private uh, sectors. Um, I believe uh, that both of the work of our task force, uh, which has identified, uh, as Antonio Matonti, Matonti said before, uh, potential KPI to monitor, and uh, the anti-corruption working group, uh, which has been working on identified uh, on identify indicators for assessing uh, corruption levels. Uh, have brought and will bring a significant value to the fight against such phenomena. I guess that we all have to be proud for the results achieved so far, and we will continue our fight against corruption and for a sustainable governance. Thanks to the panelists for their contribution and to all the co-chairs. Thanks to our task force manager and all the task force members for this edition of B20 Italy. Uh, but let me thank uh, in particular Emma for uh, her passion and uh, her strong uh, leadership uh, along uh, our common uh, journey. Thank you to all again. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Greco. And now uh, we can close this dialogue between uh, uh, B20 and G20. I really hope you found it useful and, uh, and interesting as, uh, as I did. I thank all of you for attending and uh, for your attention. So I wish you a pleasant rest of the day.